Welcome everyone to the Zero Project family. You truly are a family. Uh, this meeting is being recorded. Plus participants who are with us over these three days. And we can't make this virtual global conference with three simultaneous channels happen without valuable partner and trusted partner organizations such as yourself. So I really want to um, give a shout out not only to especially Sterna Foundation and IBM and the entire teams, but also to individuals such as Toriko uh, Sonne, who um, was in, in touch with me and I know how much resources she has put in and her colleagues have put in. So really a big, big thank you. Um, you truly enrich um, our conference with your sessions and with your content. And we've already received great feedback on other partner channel sessions. And I'm sure this great feedback will continue after your session as well. I personally look forward to a very interesting session. Um, very intrigued by uh, what you'll have to say and I wish you all the best and I'll leave it at that and on just on a personal note um, I want to extend um, also a thank you from the entire Zero Project team from Michael Fembeck our director down to to our interns and everyone uh, in between every uh, really, thank you thank you thank you and over to you. Well thanks so much uh, Robin <clears throat> and thanks to Michael and and Martin and the whole Zero Project for this important work that you do to remove barriers for people with disabilities and for giving us this opportunity to share our joint journey towards inclusive employment of neurodivergent individuals. I'd also like to thank uh, IBM for providing the WebEx plat platform for this uh, webinar. It, it is being recorded as we speak and the uh, captions will be added uh, afterwards. And there's a, a chat box and we will encourage you to send questions, comments, and then uh, we'll have a, a discussion at the end of the presentation um, based on what is coming in in the chat box. So uh, first, thank you. So uh, Specialist and Foundation, uh, we are not profit. I founded it back in 2008. Our vision is a world with equal opportunities for all in the labor market. We started with autism and we are gaining knowledge that we hope can benefit more generic. Uh, the foundation operates the specialist in a brand and we are associated with the UN Department of Global Communications, helping spread the, the UN messages. Diane? Oh, um, hi. Hi. So this is just an um, entry chart about IBM. So um, hopefully most of you have heard about IBM, International Business Machines. We are an enterprise technology company that helps clients to serve their clients. Um, we have, uh, were founded in 1911, so celebrating 110 years. We operate in 175 countries and we have um, approximately 350,000 employees worldwide. And we were, um, um, we received the, our 28th year of patent leadership uh, through 2020 with 9,130 patents. So, thank you, Turka. Thank, and, uh, and this is for you to meet the team in the panel. Myself, I'm a father of an autistic child. This got me into social entrepreneurship. I'm chairman of the, the Danish government's uh, Council for Corporate Responsibility and Sustainable Development Goals. And I'm founder of uh, Specialistene. Over to you, Yves. Thank you, Thorkiel. So my name is Yves Veillier. I'm based in Belgium. I am a member of the IBM's Global uh, Diversity an inclusion team and my role is basically to drive IBM's diversity uh, agenda globally and I work quite closely with my uh, colleagues uh, in IBM to you know to advance uh, the diversity inclusion agenda globally. Thank you. Hi so IBM has been on our neurodiversity journey for just over five years now um, and I'll share some of that journey with you a little bit later today. Um, last March, I joined a team of dedicated and passionate individuals as the neurodiversity at IBM program manager. Um, I'm a neurodiversity ally. 
and I'm really honored to have the opportunity to lead this program. Um, I have autistic family members and friends with autistic children, and they've shared with me that programs like this give them hope that they can have a fulfilling and meaningful job that embraces their strengths while working to understand their challenges. So thank you very much for inviting me to, to be part of today's panel. Matt? Uh, I need to un unmute. Hi, everyone. Thank you. Uh, my name is Matt Lakowski, and I am the Global Neurodiversity at IBM Business Resource Group uh, co-chair. I myself am proudly neurodivergent, um, and I've been the co-chair since 2016. I'm also the parent of an autistic IT professional, so I have both uh, experiences of my own and seeing my own son struggle and go through and hit some of those barriers that we're going to be talking today. Luciano? Okay, thank you. My name is Luciano Falcinoni. I'm located in Brazil. I'm IT executive for IBM and I'm passionate about uh, diversity and inclusion and I truly believe that we can drive innovative teams uh, doing inclusion in the right way. So, thank you for the opportunity here. Hi, my name is Frances Stack. I am also father of a daughter with autism, and I have been working at the Specialist Center for eight years, leading the, the, the office in Spain, an office in Italy, another in Sao Paulo, where we meet with Luciano, and I started to work with IBM, and also spreading the, the model for all Latin America. So today we would like to take you through our agenda. We are in the introduction phase and uh, we'll share the sustainable development goal in particularly eight and, uh, and talk about the UN human rights and discuss your diversity and barriers to in inclusion. Then uh, we will hear a lot about uh, IBM's experiences and how Specialista has supported uh, the the journey at IBM and, and with other clients. And then the, the, the super interesting thing is what, what could you do next to also to, to join this journey? And then we'll go into a, a Q&A session. So the sustainable development goals is, were adopted by all UN nations member states in 2015 and providing a blueprint for addressing the major challenges facing the world, including strategies for reducing the inequalities that are hindering prosperity for the planet and the people. <clears throat> it's often referred to as a global solidarity project and this is exactly how, how I see it. The aim of Sustainable Development Goal 8 is a decent work and economic growth. And it is to promote sustained, inclusive and sustainable economic growth, full and productive employment and decent work for all. And more specifically, one of the, the targets of the STD 8 is target 5, which specifically is directed at achieving full and productive employment and decent work for all, including for persons with disabilities and is equal pay for work of equal value. So this is actually what all governments and uh, more and more companies are committing to. So, uh, so we, are, we are part of something bigger in our efforts here. Um, on the human rights side, um, the, the STD 8 mirrors the Article 27 of the UN Convention, Convention of the Rights of Persons with Disabilities which recognizes that the right of persons with disabilities to work on an equal basis with others and to a work environment that's open, inclusive and accessible to persons with disability. And, um, and what is uh, disability? Well, first uh, I'll give the word to, to Eves. And Torquil, I think Eve uh, had to drop, and can, so can we circle back to him? Yes. 
we'll get back to, to Eve when he returns. So if you would go to slide number eight, please. Yeah, the, the, yes, here we are. So to understand the challenges of unemployment, we have to understand the, the context of disability based on the social model as described in the preamble to the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disability, where disability is recognized as an evolving concept that results from the interaction between the person with impairment and attitudinal and environmental barriers that hinders full and effective participation in society on an equal basis with others. So it's, um, it's an evolving, evolved from the old med medical uh, way of understanding disability as a set of impairments that in the right combinations uh, gives um, uh, a diagnosis. So this is an evolving relationship and attitudes and the environment you put people in is really decisive for, for the impact. Um, so this is what we do. We do what we can to re reduce the attitudinal and environmental barriers. In recent years, some employers uh, with support of the civil society have responded to the gap in employment of autistic adults by launching employment programs aimed at what we normally uh, refer to as neurodiversity, which is a concept where neurological differences are to be accepted and respected as any other human variation. These differences can include autism, attention deficit, hyperactivity disorder, dyslexia, dyscalculia, dyspraxia, Tourette syndrome, and many other neurological differences. We estimate that autism affects more than 1% of any population, ADHD and other diagnoses even more, maybe up to more than 10% of the population. And uh, what we learned from the autism uh, space is that among autistic persons, the on or underemployment rate may be as high as 80%. So high unemployment rate, but also underemployment rate counts. So you may have a computer science degree, but you pack bags in the grocery store. That is what we refer to as underemployment. So based on the experiences from these employment programs, employers have begun to discuss models for inclusive neurodivergent workforce, motivated by the desire to be socially responsible employers, but also for the purpose, of course, of gaining competitive advantage by capitalizing on the skills and abilities that people on the autism spectrum have in greater abundance than neurotypical workers do. The root causes for the lack of inclusion of neurodivergent persons in workplaces and communities have been the attitudinal and environmental barriers that we referred to before. Now we're going to hear a, a very impressive story about how a major global company and a social entrepreneur organization have worked together to overcome many of these barriers. Over to you, Diane. Okay, thank you, Turco. Thanks. Um, so as I mentioned, IBM's been on this journey for just over five years. So it was um, back in 2015 when a coworker of ours, Paul Austin in New York, uh, attended the United Nations World Autism Awareness Day. And this is where he heard from several companies, um, including Ernst & Young, Microsoft, and SAP, talk about their autism programs. And that inspired Paul to begin the Autism as a Skill Business Resource Group at IBM and start IBM on this journey. Um, over the next year, our BRG grew to about 500 people. Um, and Paul and another coworker, Andrew Williams, um, in Australia, met Torquil um, and began working together on this effort. And it was in 2016 where they were, form they were able to um, formalize a partnership between Specialist Sterna and IBM. And our partnership relationship has grown over the years as Specialist Sterna has helped us with um, several of our 
hiring efforts and training of our employees. And then in 2017, this was our first um, pilot of hiring six uh, autistic individuals in Lansing, Michigan, um, and it was a very, very successful pilot. Um, in 2018, we rebranded our program to go from an autism program to the broader umbrella of neurodiversity. Um, so we did the branding in 2018, and we created a wonderful 14-minute documentary called When Neurodiversity Works, and that highlights the pilot that we ran the year before. In 2019, our BRG had grown to over 1,400 members, and those members include neurodivergent employees as well as allies. Um, we launched an actually autistic task force, and then in 2020, we launched an actually neurodivergent task force. Um, these task forces provide um, support and safe spaces for our employees and are also a key part of our program. And Nat's going to talk a little bit more about those in a minute. And um, we also secured an executive sponsor, and that's something that's very important for a program and to help it to be successful. And we continued our hiring and hired in uh, three other countries. And then that brings us to 2020, and that was when I joined the team. And our program was officially launched, um, the Neurodiversity at IBM program. Um, we focused last year on a lot of enablement uh, for our employees. We have a wonderful course uh, learning bundle called Neurodiversity 101 that we developed with Optimize. And um, we have gotten this out to many employees. We've had over 1,600 IBM employees complete this training in just one year. And um, our focus is to continue sharing that training with all of our employees. Um, I mentioned the task force we launched, and then we continued hiring, and we did um, neurodivergent hiring last year in six countries. And that brings us to 2021, and we're kicking off the year. Um, and really building upon the three key components of our program, and that's the enablement of all of our employees, um, enhancing our processes and our tools so that they're more inclusive of neurodivergence as well as, as every person, um, and then the hiring of neurodivergent talent. And so we believe these three things will help us to move from awareness to acceptance and finally to advancement. And I'm going to turn it over to Nat. Um, hi, everyone, again, um, the, some of those really One of the exciting things that uh, we have at IBM is our actually autistic and actually neurodivergent task forces. These are run through Slack and they are by invitation only. So someone needs to reach out to one of the members and say, I would like to join. These are safe spaces. There's an honor system there. And this is where IBMers who are neurodivergent can come for support. It is a safe space. So that's the first primary uh, purpose of it. The other purpose is that it's a platform to rally where we can get all of our voices combined, where we can create initiatives of our own and push them up to people like Diane and HR and benefits. And it works the other way too, where Diane could come in and say, hey, I want this to be vetted and vetted by the community. So it's really, uh, it's really exciting. And one thing I like to say, I'm a big gardener, so the acceptance culture change needs to cultivate the soil. You need to turn things over so the new seeds that land can blossom. 
and it gets the weeds out for people already here, like me, and it makes the garden better for everybody. Okay, my turn now. Thank you. Thank you again for the opportunity. So, uh, I, I, I would like to share here is a, is a success, what I consider a successful uh, story. Uh, right. So, few years, few years ago, we were in the middle of agile and transformation uh, journey here in the IT organization inside of IBM in Brazil, specifically. And, you know, we were restructuring the teams, we were cultivating a new culture, we were lear uh, learning about the agile transformation. We had all the governance models set, but when we were thinking about our major goal, which was create uh, innovative exponential teams, we, we felt like we were missing uh, some piece inside of that puzzle. And one of the coincidences of life, I mean, I was invited by diversity inclusion team in Brazil to join a multidisciplinary team with the focus to provide a best experience to all the people with disabilities inside of IBM. When, when I start that work, I realized for the first time that we really could join purpose and business uh, with the same goal. I mean, we, we really could use a large corporation as IBM or any other corporation that we, that we have to drive inclusion in the proper way. So we were progressing that journey with people with disabilities. And then one year later, again, I was invited by this team to join a neurodiversity uh, conference. Uh, they asked me to do the closure for this event and be completely open. I mean, I had no idea by that time after I accepted what was, what was neurodiversity. So, but I accept the challenge. I went to, to this conference in Sao Paulo. Uh, there was several companies like Dianimation, SAP and other companies. And also we had a specialist there. there. So a specialist there brought some neurodiversity professional uh, related to IT specifically, and I was just, you know, that blew my mind. I mean, I was so uh, engaged with, with those professionals, uh, and I understood and realized once again that if we really want to make a change in our organization, we Inclusion was much broader than what I what I understood by that time. Our our by the way, I forgot to mention our first step with people with disability was we had twelve uh, hirings, uh, new hirings to be approved in my organization. The challenge that I gave to my leaders was, you know, I will only approve these twelve positions if you make six of that with people with disability. So. That was the, the first step we took to a major goal to initiate this journey. Then after this, this event on neurodiversity with Specialist 10, I just left the event in, uh, knowing that we had also to, to expand our inclusion program inside of IT and neurodiversity professional was a great fit to our area. So the, what we did was we didn't know actually how to start. We had a very lack of knowledge in the topic. So I scheduled a couple of meetings with the diversity team and in specialist 10. So we went there. We start to learn more about this, the topic. We had a lot of conversation with specialist 10. And then we together, we established, we, we understood that we would only be able to achieve that if we made that part of our strategy. And if we really set proper goals uh, to make that happen. So that's what we did. We create a formal plan uh, to include neurodiverse people inside of our two organization in Brazil. Um, we did a partnership with Specialist 10 so they could help us with the, all the knowledge and the assistance to make that happen. I led the business case approval inside of IBM and I think this is important. As I said, I mean, you really can tie uh, the inclusion pro purpose with also business goals. 
And after one year, we were able to hire 12 professionals with autism inside of our organization. And that was another breakthrough that we had in the team. I mean, what we, what we have seen until now is we have seen an increase of the engagement inside of the team, increase of collaboration, understanding on how different things, thoughts, and history can really make an innovative team. So we have plans to expand that. My, my goal is to double this target this year. Uh, I, I think we have no way back on that journey. I mean, as I say, inclusion is a journey that there is only winners. There is no losers. Everybody wins. Um, and if I can leave three learning points that I, that I have learned uh, during this, this journey inside of IBM is, I think first, all the leaders inside of any organization, we do have some empowerment, some level of empowerment, and we can take action, action to make things happen, like inclusion. We don't need to wait for the CEO or the board or the high level structure of the organization to tell what you need to do. For sure, you have some level of empowerment that you can take an action to make that happen. So that was what happened with me. The second, the second, the second learning is ask for help. If you don't know how to do, I mean, inclusion is something very important and you need to, you need to do that properly. Uh, we cannot hire diverse people and throw all the responsibility to, to these people so they can integrate to the environment that we have. To me, that is integration. When we talk about inclusion, we hire diverse people, but we change the whole environment to adapt to everyone. So to all the diversities, all the differences that we have. So that's so ask for help. That's what we did with Specialist 10. And my last uh, learning is take the first step. I mean, this is a agile culture mindset. I mean, think bold. I mean, you really can think bold. You can be the most inclusive company in the world. You can set whatever is the bold goal you have, but take a first step. I mean, start small, do that incrementally. I mean, we started with six professionals with disabilities, and now we are moving to a much larger organization with inclusion people. So that's what I would like to share in a few minutes and I make myself available for any future discussion. Appreciate the time here. Thank you. Okay, my time. Okay, uh, Luciano, I think that IBM is a pioneering company in including with autistic talent and, and neurodiverse talent. And we have cooperated with you in many different countries, both including autistic people following our methodology but also creating awareness inside the company to explain what autism is, what neurodiversity is, and which is the value that neurodivergent people can bring. So for example, we have been doing onboarding uh, in Australia, Canada, and Brazil. We have been doing workshops in, in Italy, et cetera. But at the Specialist 10, we have included people in more than 20 countries. And we know that depending on the country, we have to use a, a different inclusion formula to reach the same goal, that is to have neurodivergent people fully included in the company and to have that company realizing all the business and social value that you can provide. So although we have a global method to include autistic people that appears in the next slide and that starts with finding potential positions for them, continuous looking for the candidates, training them and putting them to work with a specific support, we know that you have to adjust the method for each country. For example, in Brazil, we know we need to work more on developing the social skills of the candidates, as in many cases, they have not received any kind of social skills training before coming to us. And in Italy, in some cases, we have to explain everybody that most autistic people can work eight hours per day because um, there is a tendency to overprotect uh, those people, and this is also something that, that, that uh, is, is not okay when they really can work uh, these hours. So, um, on the next slide, please, um, here you can see more or less our methodology that uh, uh, 
starts analyzing the roles, finding the people, in training them, putting them to work, and providing that support. And we believe this this support uh, is quite important to to help the company to understand neurodiversity, to to adapt processes, etc. And it is also important to acknowledge that the level of maturity of an of any organization, even any organization in different countries and of the entire society, can be very different. So on the next slide, please, we can see what we call our maturity model. Uh, what we have, we try to explain and define uh, that each organization can be in a different level of preparation for including neurodiversity, and that there are many things to do, starting with awareness, following perhaps with pilot projects like uh, the ones that IBM did some years ago, and then adapting internal human resources processes and protocols to be more neurodiversity friendly, etc. Until we can reach a status of a company that fully embraces neurodiversity. Thank you, Francesc, and thank you, the great IBM team. So um, uh, I think now I hope we, we will trigger a lot of, uh, of questions uh, on how you can, uh, as Luciano say, take the first step, don't wait. So you may not have uh, be in a big company like IBM with 350,000 people and uh, professionals in, in uh, the right positions to support you. But uh, so, so what can you do? And I think there's, there's, a, there's a lot uh, uh, you can start doing. Um, the first thing is really learn from, from the experienced uh, organizations such as Specialist and, and IBM, but, but there are very many others. And uh, Professor Rob Austin is, is, um, has been writing many articles for Howard Business Review and Business School. Next, next page, please. <clears throat> and he has, um, will you flip the, to the next slide? Professor Rob Austin is, is probably the one with the, uh, the best overview of the very many different programs. But he has uh, three major findings. And one is that the your diversity employment programs help companies assess maximum talent to help them prevail in innovation-based competition. So I, I shared a bit of the statistics uh, from within the autism uh, space of maybe up to 80% on un or underemployed. If you were in an HR department, you would say, my goodness, that could be a potential gold mine that uh, has not been tapped into before. So, uh, and that's just the autism part. Then there's the, the, the other parts of the neurodiversity spectrum where, where many also struggles to, to get through the recruitment processes into the company and to be managed in a, a way that fits the individual. So a huge potential here for adding talents for employers. Finding number, number two is that when we design organizational solutions for people on the autism spectrum or for others who are newer diverse, large percentage of what we design usually turns out to benefit all employees. And uh, this is also what we are working together with the IBM uh, about how can we take the knowledge from our experiences uh, initially with autism, broaden it to neurodiversity, but, uh, but also go beyond, uh, beyond that. And this is also back to the maturity model that Francesc talked about. So the, the top level should be where we have used our learnings to adapt how do you uh, conduct a recruitment talk. And the ambition is to get to the same level. So when, when you go to uh, apply for a job, it shouldn't really matter if you are neurodiverse or neurotypical 
because the employer will have learned how to assess your person and your talent uh, as a potential added uh, uh, fit to, to add value in the company. When we get there, I think we'll have much more inclusive and engaged uh, work environments. The third finding is that when companies implement neurodiversity employment programs, it makes all employees feel good about the work and the company. It, uh, it often brings add a, a purpose to, to where most focus may have been on on performance and business, but, but suddenly if you get a chance to work with someone that you can actually learn, get a learning experience, you can feel that you have supported someone to be given this one chance in a life that maybe after years of being rejected, suddenly uh, you, you welcome a person and it, it's an extreme joy of work that you can experience from that and uh, you can learn so much uh, personally. So next slide please. So how do we create a, a welcoming workplace? And I I think I'll mention Luciano a couple of times how to just get started. Um, you, you have to to practice how to communicate um, because autism is, is not so much about the person. It is um, the space between us. So in order to solve that challenge, we, we have to be curious on both sides, both the, on the employer side, the manager side and, and the, the person side, because there are so many misunderstandings that can occur, uh, like why don't you get it uh, no back again? Uh, what's, what's wrong with you? Um, on, and on the other side, what I, did I do wrong and, and uh, why should I? So it's really about how we work together, how we communicate, how we um, talk together. And a very famous man, Randy Lewis, the former CEO of, of Walgreens Distribution Centers, at a conference he offered for free um, this method called ATP, which stands for ask the person. So it may seem very complex if you don't ask the questions, then you try to interpret it on each side. And I think a, a very good trick is to, to um, get used to, to ask the person. We all also have found that um, there are particularly four values that help um, create a welcoming workplace. The values, the first one is respect, that yes, here is a person who have a disorder, a disability, uh, but you should expect the same. You should not hire this person for to, to make you feel good and, and to click your uh, uh, success criteria for CSR. You, you should hire because um, you expect you have tasks to, to be done and that this person can actually do the tasks. So uh, treat the person with the same uh, expectations that you would with others, but also respect that people are different. And this is actually what makes teams strong. Um, accommodation is value number two. So many have sensory issues, visual, audio. Some, for, for some, the ideal workload may be 30 hours instead of 40 hours. There's some may need to be able to withdraw for uh, a moment if, uh, if uh, anxiety gets too high. So you, you should have such an opportunity to create this comfort zone where the person can excel. Clarity, set expectations, clearly say what you mean and mean what you say, because it, it's so uh, consuming of brain power to try to figure out what is the interpretation of what the other person wants me to do if you don't say it. So just say it. 
say what you mean, mean what you say. That makes life so much easier. The last one is accessibility. So if, if you need guidance, you should also always know where to go and get guidance. What we hear as feedback is that uh, four values like respect, accommodation, clarity, and accessibility is very popular with everyone in the workplace. It may reduce the stress level. It may people uh, work better and more precisely together. Next one, please. And uh, diversity you should see as an asset. It was in the industry phase where, uh, where we should be able to replace items in the um, assembly line. And there it was a problem if things deviated. Now in a global non-space market economy, we really need people who, who think uh, uh, out of the box and who can come up with innovative solutions that no one else had thought about. So the, the, the ability to question, to ask why this, to find new solutions to problems that may have existed for a very long time, it really benefits the, the work environment if we bring in different perspectives. So this is both a creative and economic advantage to include neurodivergent persons. Next one, please. Making the match. So do you have tasks that are not carried out in uh, high quality? Do you need fresh perspectives from other ways of thinking? Um, it's, it's really, um, it, there, there's so many tasks that I believe uh, can be a good fit for autistic persons. I've challenged many saying that at least 5% of all tasks I think would fit autistic people very well. And if I'm right, then it should not be a problem if, if, if 1% um, is, of the population is on the autism spectrum, there should be enough uh, task. And when you make the match, you will find a lot of joy of work. We have experience from cybersecurity to pig farming. Uh, so anything in between pig farming and cybersecurity could be a potential good match for autistic and neurodivergent persons. Next slide, please. <clears throat> So I think we are at the, the question part, and I don't know if Eves is back. So maybe Eves, if you're back, you could comment on uh, on the slide that slide seven that we missed when you left. <laughs> Absolutely, thank you, Turkila. I'm sorry for having to drop uh, during the, the, the conversation, and I'm glad to be back. I hope you, you can all hear me hear me well. Very good, yes. Okay, so if you are right, so I can see the slide. So basically, uh, you know, I will not elaborate too much on the different uh, cultural perceptions of, uh, of disability that, that you see on the uh, right hand side of the slide. Uh, most of them are well known and, and apply not only to the uh, concept of disability as such, um, but also on other uh, conditions such as uh, neurodiversity. I would rather like to insist on what's on the left hand left hand side um, of the slide. Um, you know, when we have our conversations with uh, representatives from from the business, from the governments, and and so on, as, and, and I believe that this is this session now is the perfect example of that. Uh, beside any cultural perceptions of disability that are an absolute reality and no one can contest this, uh, I think, I believe strongly that we should stop talking about disability as a problem located with the individuals in general. I think we should always, always refer to disability as uh, or even neurodivergent condition as an environmental issue. What I mean by that is, um, you know, let's make people understand that in most cases, 
maybe not in all cases, honestly, but in most cases, in the vast majority of cases, uh, disability is not determined by levels of pathologies or functional uh, limitations, but instead the very notion of disability depends on whether the physical or digital uh, environment is accommodating or not um, uh, accommodating to the disabling conditions. And I believe that if people, uh, beside, as I said, any cultural differences, uh, cultural perceptions or stereotypes associated with notions such as neurodiversity or disability, but if people will start thinking about, instead of thinking, I am a manager and I need to uh, to hire someone who will be less productive, who will need more time to do this and that, instead of having a manager thinking from that angle and start thinking, okay, that person is different from me. What can I do to make my environment accessible and welcoming for that person to be as productive as anybody else. In other words, as I said, instead of looking at the person's disability, let's look at the environment that disabling the person and what can I do as a manager to make my workplace more accessible, more welcoming in terms of physical accessibility, digital accessibility, etc., to make that person as productive as anybody else in my team. I believe that is my really my, my, my key message as part of this session to try to change the mindset of people. We've been repeating years and years and years that people with diverse abilities will bring innovation, etc. And this is absolutely true. But honestly, when you look at the percentage of people who are unemployed, living with different conditions, whether it's neurodivergent condition or disability in general, when you look at the percentage, you realize that, you know, we need to change the, the, the paradigm. We need to shift completely the mindset. And I believe that thinking about disability or your divergent condition from an environmental perspective versus a personal perspective will, in the long run at least, or hopefully in the medium term, uh, change the situation for, for the better. You're on mute, Torquil. Yeah, I just want to thank you, Yves. This was a very good sum up of, of the discussion today, I think. So uh, let's see if there are questions or comments. So I think we have, um, well, there's one question here that uh, I will read out. So I'm a person in uh, Rio de Janeiro, Brazil was hired in November as an IT developer intern and um, unsurprisingly diagnosed with ADHD. And they ask if anything, if there's anything they could do to help um, ND at IBM. And then also uh, what kind of support does a person like them diagnosed after having been hired? Um, what could they, what could they, um, what kind of support could there be? So maybe Nat, do you want to um, take the support question? I would. I, I yes. would. I would love. I would love that uh, ability. So first, uh, so wonderful and brave for you to come out about being neurodivergent, and I actually use that term specifically because. The LGBTQ movement so matches what we're seeing in the neurodiversity uh, movement where it started grassroots and then you got some executives on board and now, you know, we're kind of getting to the meat of the sandwich, both from the top down and from the bottom up. So thank you so much. Um, we definitely could use your help um, at ND at IBM. Uh, we have a lot of uh, initiatives going on. Uh, one of them is we're forming a presentation squad where IBMers who are neurodivergent can go out to our tribes and our teams and do uh, pitches and tell their story. Uh, we have video testimonials where, again, if people are brave enough to come out to share our mission and also show, as I mentioned, our diversity, that it's not all you know, white male, or it's not all, you know, only people that program, that we are that we are everywhere. Um, we'd, I'd also love to invite you into our safe space channel where you can get support 
as needed and not worry about any discrimination and also have your voice heard to be one of the voices that get to vote and, and, and make influence on not only IBM initiatives, but things externally, even like today, like what we're doing today. Great. And Luciano, any comments from Brazil? Oh, my, 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 my first comment is, I, I think this question is, uh, represents the, the results that we, we were discussing when we said, you know, take the first step and you start to see the engagement because Joe or Joel, <laughs> here, kind of translating his name in English, but, uh, you know, he's part of IT organization Rio uh, and he's just uh, coming here to uh, declaring that, that he's, he's a neurodivergent as well. And so I think when you start, uh, uh, when, when you take the first step and start the process inside of, of your company as, uh, for inclusion, I mean, you see that a lot of people will start to onboard that. So I think that's outstanding and, 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 and is the results of the actions that we are taking. I think the help, as Nat said, I mean, we need to learn. I mean, as leaders, we need to learn as a program, we need to learn. So everything that someone can share with us so we can learn more and expand our knowledge to, to make the inclusion uh, happen inside of the organization, that's great. And there are some specific actions that we are taking uh, locally with the uh, diversity and inclusion team that are in process. I cannot announce that yet, but I hope soon we will be able to strengthen even more this, the chapter of neurodiversity in Brazil. Um, so, Joe or Joe, if you want to look for me in the Slack or call me, let's have a virtual coffee, and for sure you can be a great help for us. We need our yep. lives. Well, one thing I also wanted to mention is that accommodations for neurodivergence usually cost little to no money. Um, and obviously everybody's worried about profit these days. Um, some of the accommodations for a neurodivergent may be as simple as they need to, they can't sit near the noisy printer or by the elevator or the bathroom. Some may prefer a more quiet environment or being able to work from home or good uh, uh, active noise canceling headphones or even a change in work hours where you come in a little bit later, so you're not mentally exhausted from fighting the trains and buses of the commute, obviously, you know, after COVID, um, but, or just an open heart and an open dialogue with your manager to say, I work better in this condition versus that, um, and be able to bring your whole self 